Uh, okay, so I'd like to um, thank the organisers for the invitation and for putting together this very nice workshop, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, I'm particularly looking forward to the discussion sections. I think, you know, the, there's, it's a very rich field, decadal variability, as we've, we've already heard about. And I think there are lots of uh, important topics that we can discuss in this uh, unique opportunity of the workshop. Um, so, so my talk will be largely a review, although I'll, I'll also show one or two new results and uh, raise a few of the points that I hope we can, we can discuss in the discussion sections. Um, I'm going to talk about attribution of decadal change and, and fundamentally why it's so difficult. Um, <clears throat> uh, it's not, however, going to be solely a, a sort of a uh, a, a discussion of how terribly difficult it is. I'm also going to be talking about some of the opportunities, and some of those opportunities relate to the rapidly growing field of decadal prediction that, of course, many people in the room are involved in. So the, the links between attribution and prediction is, is one of my themes. Uh, how do I change the slides, then? Oh, this thing does. Does it? Okay, I've done the wrong thing already. This doesn't matter. There we go. Okay. So, um, I, I, as uh, everybody knows, and we've already heard this morning, I think, um, the evolution of climate on, on decadal timescales depends on, on two fundamental types of processes. One is the internal variability that Mojib talked about, and the other is the response to a range of forcings. And we can think both about natural forcings, like volcanic or solar forcings, and anthropogenic forcings. And decadal prediction, of course, uh, the, the, the basic challenge is to work out, well, what's that combination of internal variability and responses to forcings that is critical for the next decade? That's, that's the decadal prediction problem. Whereas the attribution problem looks back to events in the past and says, well, actually, what was that particular combination for particular specific observed events? Um, <clears throat> And that, that includes to what extent the events were predictable, because, of course, some aspects of climate are more predictable than others. Um, so I think it's, it's a fairly obvious uh, but important statement that if we're going to have any confidence in decadal predictions, we've got to demonstrate that actually we're really good at the attribution problem, that we can look at all these past events that, that we've seen in the talks from, from uh, Jochen and Moji and say, we understand why that happened, and we know to what extent it was predictable. Now, clearly, you know, we're a long way from that situation now, but that is what we need to be able to do in order to really have confidence in indicator predictions. Um, so just to say a little bit more about attribution, there are, there are typically two levels of attribution. There's what, what you might call proximal attribution and ultimate attribution. So proximal attribution is all about, well, what, what, what were the processes that were important to some particular uh, event that we saw. You know, maybe it was some shift in the storm track, or maybe we have some evidence that changes in sea surface temperatures really mattered for this event. And then the ultimate attribution is about this distinction between internal variability and forced responses. And <clears throat> both types of questions are important, and of course to have a complete understanding we need to be able to do both the proximal attribution and the ultimate attribution for any particular problem of interest. Uh, and of course when we're looking at the the ultimate attribution, that includes questions about, well, is the forced response just a linear addition, or is there actually some interesting interaction here? Perhaps the forced response is manifest in terms of changes in internal variability, as we've heard about. Uh, and that's something that we need to unpick, and that can often be quite difficult to unpick. Uh, we should also recognize that when we look back at observational records, we can see interesting things going on, and sometimes... They're nothing to do with climate processes, they're to do with observational issues, so we have to bear that in mind. So we've heard some examples of attribution problems, and I think you know, there's no better illustration of how difficult attribution is than looking at all the debate that there's been about the, the, the uh, so-called hiatus in global mean surface temperature over the last decade. Uh, you know, in, in broad terms, we understand that this is some combination of internal variability and forced responses. But of course, quantitatively, the uncertainties remain large. And that's because it's a tough problem, and I'll, I'll say a bit more about that. Some other examples, so Atlantic multi-decadal variability Moji have introduced, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Um, and the Sahel rainfall uh, uh, problem that uh, Jochenen talked about is, is another good example of you know, really significant decadal timescale changes in the climate system 
that we need to be able to uh, unpick and get to the bottom of. Um, <clears throat> so why is it so difficult, uh, the attribution problem and, and the prediction problem? Well, it comes down to three, uh, three areas of ignorance, uh, as indicated there. So we have ignorance of the characteristics of internal variability in the system. We have ignorance of aspects of the forcing. Um, for, for, for decadal time scales, the issues around aerosol forcing and uh, volcanic forcing are particularly important. Greenhouse gas forcing is, is better quantified on the whole. Um, and we have ignorance of the responses to the forcings. So we've got these three areas of ignorance. Um, <clears throat> this slide shows the relative importance of these different areas of ignorance uh, when we think about pr predictions or projections here of global mean temperature. And <clears throat> this shows the total uncertainty, and then this shows normalized as a, as a, uh, uh, as a function of lead time, uh, normalized by the total uncertainty at each lead time. And if you look a few decades ahead, you see how this is the internal variability and this is the response uncertainty. So those are the most important source of uncertainty, typically a few decades ahead. As you look further ahead, uncertainty about the forcing, and this, in this case this includes greenhouse gas forcing, uh, becomes increasingly important. This is for global mean temperature. As we come down in spatial scale and time scale, then the internal variability becomes increasingly uh, a, a big issue. So, ignorance of internal variability, um, this is a, a very nice slide that Ed Hawkins put together, which uh, illustrates the magnitude of the problem. So, these are uh, a set of uh, current climate models, and these are simulations of internal variability in global mean temperature uh, from control simulations with these climate models. And what you see is a huge range of behavior, uh, variations in the uh, magnitude of variability and the spectrum of that variability. And these are state-of-the-art models. And actually, we don't know which, which is the best model here. Uh, we can have a go at saying which might be uh, implausible. But actually, it's, it's quite a hard issue to constrain, because for the real world, we can't cleanly separate internal variability from force responses. So what is realistic decadal variability is, is a tough problem. Um, <clears throat> uh, Ed did a nice analysis here where he just looked at a could, could we come up with some simple constraints from observations? So uh, in particular, what he looked at was just taking the observations and then uh, uh, supposing that the, linear, that the forced response was either a linear trend or some kind of high-order high polynomial fit. And then if you look at the residuals and say, well, we'll call that the decadal variability, then you can come up with some constraints that look like this. So on the, on, the left, uh, on the horizontal axis here, we've got the standard deviation of global mean temperature. On the right-hand axis, we've got the lag one autocorrelation, so how red is the variability. And so this area in the middle might be, might be the uh, set of models that are, if you like, not obviously inconsistent with observations. And you can see from this basic analysis that actually quite a lot of models do seem to be inconsistent with observations, even in this basic parameter of internal variability. So that's um, you know, important and, and, and sobering. Um, and that's just global mean temperature. So then if we look, if we look on uh, smaller scales, then actually the issue in many ways is even more acute. So this was an analysis that Ed and I did a few years ago, <coughs> and it shows, if we just show, focus on the, top, on the top panels here, it shows the magnitude of internal variability in surface air temperature, uh, uh, obviously regionally here, uh, and the, the, the spread amongst models, this is amongst the CMIT-5 models, and what you find if you look in, in, in certain regions that there can be easily be a factor of three in the magnitude of the standard deviation of annual mean surface air temperature between different models. So that's a huge, huge range. Okay? And again, it, it reflects uh, how difficult this problem is and our large uncertainty. Um, so we need, to, we need to make progress. And obviously, a, a key issue here is, is better understanding the mechanisms of internal variability. And uh, just linking with something that Mojib talked about there, how, how the mechanisms can be dependent on the, on the mean state of, of a climate model. This is a nice, uh, just one figure from a nice paper by Matt Menery, who works at the, at the UK Met, Met Office and recently com completed a PhD with us in, in Reading. And this is an analysis of the CMIT-5 model simulations of North Atlantic decadal variability. And the interesting finding here is the high correlation between the, the bias in these models in the North Atlantic, in, in, in fact, in the Labrador Sea here. So this is the bias in temperature and salinity. And on the, on the vertical axis is a measure of the relative importance of temperature and salinity anomalies 
for controlling density anomalies. And those density anomalies are critical for affecting the MOC, for example, the overturning. So what, what this analysis shows is that the, the mean state of the model is crucial uh, to get right if you want to have a, a, a reliable simulation of North Atlantic decadal variability. So, so that's a tough, tough problem. You can't just say, well, we'll just look at anomalies and not worry too much about the mean state. You've actually got to get the mean state right if, you, if you're going to get North Atlantic decadal variability right. Um, coming on then to uh, response uncertainty. So this is the question of what is the response to particular forcings? It could be greenhouse gas forcings. It could be other forcings. Clearly, uh, there's lots of discussion about climate sensitivity, uh, the trends in climate response, for example. Everyone knows that models show a, a large range in climate sensitivity. But when we're looking on regional scales, there are many other dimensions to response uncertainty. So in particular, the issue of circulation change in the atmosphere and ocean is a crucial issue for understanding um, the uh, decadal variability and change on, on, on regional scales. Uh, a lot of uncertainty about, about circulation change. As a nice review by Ted Shepard uh, in Nature Geoscience, focuses on atmospheric circulation in particular. Um, <clears throat> and we need to be very clear that, so often we estimate this response uncertainty as in this analysis here, so that's the blue part here, by just looking at the spread amongst different models. We say this is some kind of measure of our uncertainty. We need to be very clear that that's a very crude measure of our uncertainty. There are processes missing from all the models, and so our true uncertainty is almost certainly larger. Uh, and you know, the real world may well do things that aren't in any of the models, and that in some sense is part of the response uh, uncertainty, and we need to understand that. So the big issue here is, is what I call model adequ adequacy. You know, are the models a good enough simulation of the real system in terms of their internal variability, in terms of um, the forcings and in terms of the responses. This is, this is the big issue that's, that's very tough. So let me come to a, a couple of examples. Well, in particular, I'm going to focus on the Atlantic. So um, the Atlantic is, is very interesting. This is obviously a, a smooth record of its sea surface temperatures. Uh, but the, the, the interesting thing about the North Atlantic is that the decadal variability is large by comparison with both interannual variability and actually comparable to the long-term trend in the North Atlantic. That's not true of other regions of the world. And so the, the question obviously arises, why is it there? Is it purely internal variability? Is it some response to different forcings? And people have made arguments about the importance of aerosols, greenhouse gases, volcanoes, solar variations. Um, <clears throat> there's evidence about the importance of the overturning circulation. That could be purely internal variability, or it could have been influenced by forcings. So it's a really interesting problem, and it's been the subject of much debate, as many of you will know. Uh, but there, you know, the state of play is there is no current consensus. So let me hope that someone in this room will solve this problem uh, in the next decade or before. Um, just to go into a little bit more detail, um, I'm just going to talk briefly about a couple of studies here, one a couple of years ago and one more recently. So one of the ideas about North Atlantic variability, if you like the simplest idea, is that, so if we're trying to explain the variability in sea surface temperatures, uh, a simple idea is that that might just reflect the variability in surface fluxes. And two papers that have, that have um, essentially argued different versions of that theory are shown here. So the paper by um, Ben Booth et al. argued that <coughs> um, changes in anthropogenic aerosols have been the cause of this multi-decadal variability in um, sea surface temperatures. And the basic idea there was that the, the aerosols reflect more shortwave, either directly or, or through their effects on clouds, and that that uh, modulated the surface fluxes and modulated sea surface temperatures. Uh, more recently, there's this paper by uh, Clement et al., which argues that, that all there is to the AMO is, is essentially an ocean mixed layer response to, to a modulation, in this case, of the, of the turbulent fluxes more than the, the radiative fluxes. So, um, so these are interesting ideas, but you know, we, should, we should be skeptical. So we need to ask the question, well, are, you know, are these models adequate in their representations of internal variability forcings and responses? And related to that question is, is you know, how are the models compared uh, to the real world? This is, this is a, a key question. Um, <clears throat> so with regard to the, um, the Booth et al. paper, so Rong Zhang and uh, others in the room uh, wrote a, a paper 
which, which pointed out that you know, one needs to look at a, a range of metrics. You can't just focus on sea surface temperature. In order to unpick all the processes involved, you've got to look at all, all the relevant variables. And <coughs> this paper points out that if you look at a, a, a set of relevant variables, for example, North Atlantic heat content, um, salinity and so forth, then actually there are many discrepancies between those model simulations and the real world, so that we shouldn't jump to the conclusion that just because the sea surface temperatures have evolved in a way that looks similar to the real world, that means that the, models, uh, the model is, is capturing the same processes as uh, are dominating in the real world. Um, another study which um, I was involved in looked at the observed evolution during this, um, I'll just go back, just during, during this cooling period, and <coughs> found that there are interesting changes in atmospheric circulation uh, during that cooling period, which uh, indeed seemed very likely that they modulated the turbulent fluxes uh, and that that certainly played a role in the evolution of, of the cooling. There, there are many other things going on, in fact, in, in the North Atlantic that I don't have, have time for, but, but I think you know, the basic message is that it's, it's actually quite complicated. There are many processes going on. And uh, a, a, an overly simple story of Atlantic multidecadal variability is unlikely to be correct. Um, <clears throat> the, the, the other line of evidence that I want to just talk about is the issue of ocean heat transport. So if you, if you, if you have the paradigm that you just need an ocean mix layer in order to understand Atlantic multidecadal variability, the implication is that ocean heat transport plays no role. Well, actually, there's a huge body of evidence that ocean heat transport does play a, a, a key role, and I'll just touch on some of that evidence. So uh, this is uh, from a paper by John Robson, who's over there, uh, <coughs> which uh, demonstrated that uh, the evolution of heat content in the North Atlantic in the 1990s, so these are analyses um, on, the, on the left and then model simulations on the right, and you can see uh, rather a good uh, agreement between the model simulations and the analyses in terms of the evolution of ocean heat content. And, of course, what's nice about the models is you can do a closed heat budget. So you can actually work out what were the processes that really mattered. And you can demonstrate that changes in ocean heat transport were first order important for this uh, very interesting rapid warming of the North Atlantic. This, this, these are heat content records. This is the SST, which occurred in the 1990s. And this has been independently uh, supported by a, a more recent study uh, fr fr from NCAR, so it's not just one model. And interestingly, it's also backed up by a number of independent studies um, looking at the predictability of this event. So if you initialize the ocean state, you can actually predict this very interesting warming event. And in these three different uh, model systems, it's essentially the same mechanism. It's the predictability of an increase in the northward heat transport that's fundamental to capturing this warming event. So there's lots of evidence that, that ocean heat transport is fundamental to Atlantic uh, multidecadal variability. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, there also uh, is some evidence, and this is something that needs um, looking into with, uh, with other systems, that the, the cooling in the 1960s uh, again, that the, ch the change in ocean heat transport was first order important for that cooling. And there is evidence that actually we might, we might just now be going into a state not unlike the 1960s, where the North Atlantic is starting to cool again, perhaps quite rapidly. Uh, these are the, the recent trends in ocean heat content compared to the, the previous trends, and John, John Robson's going to talk about this further tomorrow. Very interesting times in the North Atlantic. How many? Two minutes. Okay. So how rainfall? Uh, very briefly then, so this was just a, another example. So we, we, this was a study um, that Sabu and Dong and I did looking at the, re the, 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 the recovery in Sahel, Sahel rainfall that's occurred since the peak of the severe drought. And uh, we were interested to understand the, the, the mechanisms that may be going on here. And um, what, what we found in these, so these were atmosphere model simulations and we found that uh, across a range of metrics, and you can see what they are here, so not just the precipitation, but for example, the surface air temperature, sea level pressure, aspects of the African easterly jet, and so forth, these simulations are able to capture the observed changes quite well, which gives us some confidence that the same mechanisms are going on in the model as in the observations. And then if we unpick the relative importance of different forcings, the interesting and surprising finding in this particular model uh, was that in fact it's the direct, so these are, this is the, this is the impact of change in sea surface temperatures, uh, change in greenhouse gas and aerosols and change in greenhouse gases. And actually in this model it's the direct impact of the changes in relative forcing that seem to be uh, particularly important for driving the recovery of Sahel rainfall. 
Now, what about model adequ adequacy in this case? Well, it's a very fair question, and absolutely, uh, you know, this study needs to be repeated with other models. Uh, but but it's an interesting it's an interesting uh, idea that actually the direct impact of increases in greenhouse gases has perhaps been uh, very important for the recovery of Sahel rainfall. I probably don't have time for this last slide, although it's possibly my favourite. So, have I got time for this, Jochenen, or uh, shall I just wrap up? <laughs> no time, but go ahead. I like that. Okay, so this is, it's, a, it's a little bit of a digression, but um, we tend to think of attribution as being reliant on general circulation models, and of course, to a large extent, it is. But the reason I like this analysis is that it isn't reliant on general circulation models, and it's, it's just a very simple analysis that I think tells us something important. <laughs> So what it shows is, is simply a regression of decadal mean surface air temperature in, in individual locations against the global mean uh, decadal mean surface air temperature over the, la over the instrumental record. And the, the, these are the maps of the regression coefficients, and this is the fraction of the variance explained. And what you see is that, is that global mean temperature explains 60% or more of local variations in decadal mean surface air temperature over most of the planet over the instrumental record. Now what's interesting about that is that if we had a system that was purely internal variability, and, <clears throat> and here's an example from one model, but other models have differences in detail, but the fractions of the variance are always similar, then, if, then not surprisingly, but importantly, you know, the fraction of the variance is very low if we had a system that was dominated by internal variability. By contrast, if we had a system that's dominated entirely by false responses, then in principle, but if the false responses are entirely linear, then in fact we get 100% of the variance explained. There are some interesting regions where perhaps the false response is not linear. But the, but the fact that these fractions of variance are, as I say, 60% or more, is, I would say, very important basic evidence that we're actually looking at a system dominated by false responses over the last 100 years or so. And that, as I say, that's a result that's not dependent on uh, specific GCMs. I'll, um, yes, the North Atlantic is interesting. So some conclusions there. So there's a close link between attribution and prediction. Um, I didn't, I didn't emphasize, but I did illustrate that I think, you know, initialized predictions are a really nice tool for attribution, and we, and we should think about them in that, in that way. Uh, we've, in order to have any confidence in the predictions, we've got to get a lot better at attribution, so that's a, that's a challenge. Model adequacy is something that we should, you know, we should continually debate. You know, if people show you a model result, you should ask yourself, well, do you, do you, have they shown you enough evidence that this model is good enough for the aspects of climate that they're talking about to convince you that this might also be true of the real world? That's a fundamental issue. Um, we can get some confidence in those issues by looking at multivariate fingerprints, but, but, but you know, there's no, there's no simple recipe for how to get confidence. You have to dig into the details. And the last point there about, about AMV, I think, you know, it's more complicated than a mixed layer response to what the fluxes might be doing. I'll stop there. <laughs>